<laughs> well, good morning. First off, I'd like to ask for continued prayers for my best friend in the whole world. Um, hopefully, he has a speedy recovery. Everything's going well, just in case you didn't know. He had successful surgery on his shoulder, and he's home wrestling. He's doing well. So, this morning, I want to talk to you about the infamous New Year's resolutions. Now, have you ever noticed the similarity <coughs> between the word resolution and revolution? The definition of resolution is a firm decision to do or not to do something, while the definition of revolution is a forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. Now, obviously, I don't want us to overthrow the government. But I do want us to think this morning about a spiritual revolution within ourselves, an overthrow of our non-Christian world, if you will. I'm a big person about statistics. I've always liked them. I found Stephen Shapiro from Opinions Corporation of Princeton, New Jersey, offers the following statistics concerning New Year's resolutions. 45% of Americans usually set New Year's resolutions. 17% infrequently set resolutions, and 38% never set resolutions. 8% are always successful in achieving their resolutions. 19% achieve their resolutions every year. 49% had infrequent success, and 24% never succeed at all. They failed at every resolution every year. 47% set resolutions related to self-improvement or education. 38% set resolutions related to weight. 34% set resolutions related to money. And 31% said revolution related to relationships. There's actually no correlation between happiness and resolution setting, or no happier than those who do not set resolutions or who don't uh, make the resolutions work at all. So whether you set a resolution or you don't set a resolution, ultimately it doesn't determine your happiness through the year. So today I want to tell you that we can change that statistic. We can be happier if we achieve the resolutions that I'm going to suggest this morning. Now, you know, when you think about it, all New Year's resolutions basically fall into three categories. Things that make us live better and live longer. Things that make us have more. Or things that will help us get along with everyone else. Now, I've often said that we can find the answer in God's word for any question or situation of life if we would just look. So what is there in God's word about New Year's resolutions? They're not really called New Year's resolutions, but it's pretty close. So I challenge you this morning, if you haven't picked a New Year's resolution, to pick one of these. Now I'm reading from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. Now the first time I read this, I'm just going to leave out a few key words here and there. And we'll see just the benefits of adopting this set of New Year's resolutions set forth. My son, do not forget my teachings, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. You will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. He will direct your paths, will bring health to your body, <clears throat> and nourishment to your bones. Your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. You will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. You will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. The Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. Now Solomon starts off this third chapter with a pretty matter-of-fact statement. My son, do not forget my teachings, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Then he gives very specific details, ten principles that we should live by in order to have long life, prosperity, and peace. Some of these are rather simple. In fact, all of them are simple to talk about, but when it comes to putting them into practice, that's when it becomes more difficult, just like anything else in life. I really think if each one of us would adopt one or all of these principles and conscientiously live them out in the coming year that it will change our lives. Now I'm not talking about giving lip service to them like, oh, I'm gonna lose weight this year. And then June comes along and goes, well, maybe I'll wait till next year. But consciously living them out every day, making them a part of your daily life. So now let's go back up to verse three. We'll start with principle one without any left out words. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, then you will win favor and good name in the sight of God and man. So, 
love and faithfulness. Let these two qualities be the guiding light in our lives, in everything we do. That these must be the foundation for everything that we're going to do later on. I can tell you from experience, when all I loved was myself, I was not really following this resolution and I wasn't gaining the full aspect of what love was. It wasn't until I started loving others that I truly knew what love was. My Ford family, my church family, my at-home family, it, it made a huge difference. God is love. And I try to remember that in every principle. I work with numerous kids two or three times a week. I gotta remember God's love. <laughs> a definition of faithfulness. Keeping faith, maintaining allegiance, constant and loyal, showing a strong sense of duty or responsibility, conscientiousness, accuracy, reliable, exact. Now, God will never be unfaithful and never forget that. And sometimes we do lose track of that because we get thinking about man's sense of what faithfulness is. God's never unfaithful. Now this is difficult for us to do all the time. It's not just about being faithful to your spouse. It's also about being faithful to yourself and the things that you believe in. If you're not faithful in paying your light bill, you run the risk of being in the dark. Well, if you're not faithful to yourself, you run the risk of always being in the dark to everyone around you. It's a pretty powerful statement that God uh, that will never be unfaithful. So now we get to resolution two. It's another tough one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Now, the definition of the word trust is a firm belief in or confidence in the honesty, integrity, reliability, justice of another person or thing. Faith in or reliance on the person or thing trusted. How else can we define God outside of honest, full of integrity, reliable? He always seems to, to do the just thing even when we can't. So in all your ways, we want to acknowledge him. Now, to acknowledge is to admit to be true or as stated, confess. To recognize the authority or claims of. Now, trust in the Lord comes in all fashions. Do you really believe he has a plan for you? It could be trust in the Lord puts you in the right job or else you make the right decision about a big move. It can also be other things we need to trust him in. What church to attend, whether or not to go to that Bible study. That little voice in your head that says you should be doing something. Now, I spent more time on these first two resolutions than I probably spent on the rest of them together because they're important to build on for the rest of the res resolutions we're going to talk about today. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and in all your ways acknowledge Him. So now we get to some ones that are a little more difficult just because pride gets in the way or life gets in the way. But I think we can do it, and I'll try to explain how to do each one. Resolution three, do not be wise in your own eyes. This is a pretty easy one to explain. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. I know everything, except for the answers. So simply put, you're not smarter than God. If you feel God leading you somewhere, don't think you're just imagining it. Remember that God has a perfect plan for us. We're the ones that make it difficult. The longer we go against God's plan, the longer it takes for us to get back on track. It took me over a decade to get back on God's plan because I thought my plan was better. It wasn't. And my health suffered. And it says right there, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil, and this will bring health to your body. Resolution 4. Another one. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflow and your vats will burn over with new wine. This is easy to explain too. It starts with tithing. 
God's law of harvest. This means in lean times and fruitful times, give to God first. It's hard sometimes because we all, myself included, put our months ahead of our needs. Rob did a sermon series on how to be rich. And one of the things that stuck with me was we're some of the richest people in the world. But we're also the number one consumer in the world. So we make a lot of money, but we spend a lot of money too. Mm -hmm. So do you think a couple in Lithuania making $6,000 a year for buying Star Wars tickets? Or are they more worried about where are they going to eat from next? Where the next meal is coming from? The bad part about her doing a sermon on resolutions and guilt is now I feel guilty because I went to see Star Wars yesterday. But God knows I'm a nerd. So it still counts. <laughs> Resolution five. <laughs> Do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as the father and the son he delights in. Nobody likes to be disciplined. As a child, as an adult, you know, my mom, I'm sitting right here, she's smiling because she's quick to tell me if I'm doing something wrong. But if we had no discipline from the father or the ones who love us, we lose our sense of right and wrong. Raise your hand if you like setting rules for your own kids. <laughs> I hated it. Raise your hand if you like discipline in them. I still hate it. God gave us ten rules we call them commandments. It's really what we're supposed to live by. Now I bet our kids wish we only gave them ten rules. So our hope is by setting rules, and God's hope by setting his rules is that we make them better people and he makes us better people. Resolution six, search diligently for wisdom and find it. Now in this passage, it's a rather long one, but it, it actually talks about the, um, how to treat women in this, in this passage. Blessed the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver, and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies, nothing you desire to compare with her. Long lives are in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her, those who lay hold of her will be blessed. By wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundations, by understanding needs to set the heavens in place. And by his knowledge, the deeps were divided, and the clouds let drop the dew. My son reserves sound judgment and discernment. Do not let them out of your sight. There will be light for you, and ornate to ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Now he went over a lot of things that that we normally put resolutions about, right? That one passage. I want to sleep better. I want better health. I, um, I want a better life. I want safety. Now in that one passage, we find that wisdom has two sets of characteristics. We have information and knowledge and know-how. So I'm going to give you an analogy of a farmer with a tractor in a field. Now he must have the right equipment and materials, gas, but he still has to know what to do with it and what not to do with it. How to use it and how not to use it. When to use it and when not to use it. And where and when to use it and not to use it, if he's going to be a successful farmer. How many people ever see him out plowing the fields in the dead of winter? Because he's learned, to, he's learned that you plow the fields in the spring, then you plant. Now if he hadn't had that knowledge or that information, it wouldn't work out. So verse 13 and 20 talks about the characteristics of wisdom, which deal with knowledge, learning, information, intelligence, and data. Verse 21 and 24 talks about the characteristics of wisdom, which deal with perception, discernment, judgment, reason, and insight. It's just plain old common sense. You know, we know when it's 20 degrees, we probably shouldn't be out of shorts, right, Bryce? <laughs> we also know when it's 106 degrees, we probably shouldn't be out in a wool jacket. It's not good for our health. 
So the Bible even tells you how to be knowledgeable, how to, how to use the knowledge that you have to make common sense decisions. So resolution seven, have no fear. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. So when we have God on our side, we have no fear. Those who fear the darkness have no idea what the light can do. Um, I go back to something Terry said in a walk not long ago. Don't tell me how bad the storm is. Tell me how I'm going to overcome the storm. And we, we forget to do that because it's easy to say how bad things are going. It's a lot harder to figure out how to get out of it. Anybody can say, woe is me. The ones who say, all right, that's enough. This is what I'm going to do to get out of this situation or to make this better. Those are the ones that usually persevere. No matter the situation, if we're with God, we're bound for eternal glory. Amen? Amen. As a correction officer, I constantly receive threats and insults. My favorite one is, if I see you on the streets, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> my response is always the same. I run the same risk every time I get in my car. You can only die once. If you're in constant fear of what this person might do or that person might do, then you're going to be in constant fear of crossing the road or driving the car. It's not going to matter. Once you get that feeling that you're with God and it doesn't matter, you'll, you'll get a, a quietness about you. I know what awaits me after this show is long gone, and I, and I hope you do too. Resolution 8. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it. Who can I help? Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you have it with you now. So at a very early age, we're all told to go rule, treat each other like we want to be treated. So if you were hungry, you hadn't eaten in a while, do you want me to finish eating what I have and give you what's left over? Or would you want me to split it with you right from the beginning? That's the problem we have when I tell you that we're one of the richest countries, one of the biggest consumers. We're one of the leading philanthropists around the world, except for right here. This country is one of the least helpful countries to its own. What we do is we eat until we're full, and then we share. It's a very me first country. Mm -hmm. um, quick story, when I went to Vegas, it amazed me the amount of food that gets thrown out. There are companies <coughs> in Nevada that their sole purpose is to go in empty dumpsters, put in a great big machine, mix it all together, and feed it to pigs. That company averages about 450 tons of food a month. What could we do with 450 tons of unwasted food? Resolution nine, do not plot harm against your neighbor. It's another tough one. It involves trust. Do not plot harm against your neighbor if he lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Rumors are a big thing with that. If you didn't hear it straight from the horse's mouth, it probably didn't get said. If it did get said, it probably didn't get said the way, probably did not get stated the way that it got to you. This fellow here plotted great harm against this other poor young man. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm telling you, there's no reason he had to hit him that hard. I would have differed. <laughs> Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. <clears throat> For the Lord detests a perverse man, but takes the upright into his confidence. You gotta give me a minute. That hurts my feelings because this season was over. 
Hell, shoot. <laughs> hey, it's better than rings. <laughs> that. We're all going to be in the same spot next week. Well, we won't. They'll be playing golf in Hawaii. <laughs> Calendar made measurable the whole season. Do not envy a violent man. Do what's right in each situation. I mean, um, and then this is one of Terry's favorite sayings here at the end. Violence breeds violence. Contempt breeds contempt. Negativity breeds negativity. And we are all guilty of it in our own homes. I am too. I'll come home from work, I'm in a bad mood. Everybody else is in a good mood. They don't want to hear about my bad mood. And when I keep forcing my bad mood, guess what happens to them? They're in a bad mood. Does that ever happen to you? <laughs> Somebody at your house has had a great day, but you haven't. You want to tell them how bad a day you had, they want to tell you how great of a day they had. Who wins? Usually the one that's usually more upset is a little louder. Then everybody's like, well, she's not happy. I'm not going to be happy. Not that I meant to say she. I meant to do <laughs> Then I told him the ice cream man played that song when he's all out of ice cream. <laughs> that was mean. Say that was probably, the kid's probably got a little contempt at this point. <laughs> Now verse 33 and 35 are just simple statements of additional promises if we can keep the above commands. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. The wise inherit honor, but fools he holds up in shame. I like that last, that last line. The, the wise inherit honor, but fools he holds up in shame. If we're doing what we're Thing we shouldn't be doing, saying things we shouldn't be saying. We're probably not going to be held in as high esteem, I would say. So, in conclusion, just to review 10 resolutions that, that we know are in the Bible now. Love and be faithful. Trust the Lord. Remember, you're not always right. You're not smarter than God. Give more. Accept discipline without anger or resentment. Continue to learn or learn something new. Set your fears aside. Do good things for people who deserve good things. Be kind and generous. Do not harm or plot harm against others. Do not envy those who are violent or evil. Change. A bend in the road isn't the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. We've all ended up right there because we didn't make that turn. Mm -hmm. And then God starts us back over which goes back to that, the longer you do what you want to do, the longer it takes for you to get on the right path that God wants you to be on. Amen. Now, no one makes 10 resolutions. Nobody. Like I said, I showed you statistics that we barely make one. So I ask you to just choose one of these to be better at this year. doesn't matter which one, because they all make us better people and better Christians. <coughs> so... This morning we talked a lot about change and the resolutions. <clears throat> this morning we talked about change and the resolutions that can help us make those changes. We don't have to wait to make the biggest change this morning. We can make the biggest change right now. If you're here this morning, you haven't accepted the Lord, Jesus Christ in your life, you can, you can make that change right now or any other Sunday. If you're here and you're straight from the side of the Lord and started wandering on your own path, you can come back to the Lord this morning or every other morning, every other Sunday, if that's what makes you feel more comfortable. On the side of your bed works just as well. Sitting at your kitchen table works just as well. If you just need to talk to the Father this morning, maybe it's been too long, you can do that too. Once again, it doesn't have to be here. It can be on the side of your bed. It can be sitting at your kitchen table. It can be sitting on your couch. If any one of those three things <clears throat> need to be done, doesn't matter where you're doing. Just try to get them done. Just want to close with prayer this morning. Lord, thank you for the resolutions you set out for us. Thank you for showing us how to be close to you and our fellow Christians. Lord, be with everyone today as they travel home throughout the coming week. 
Lord, we ask that if there's anybody that needs to be with you, that needs to get closer to you, that they find that time to do it. Lord, thank you for letting everybody be here today. Please be with everybody who couldn't be here today. In your name we pray, amen.